Hello, everybody, and welcome to the opening of the Biomimicry Academy online platform. We will do this in a webinar setting as uh, yeah, contemporary situations require that. But I'm also um, happy to use this occasion as a combination for not only opening up the online platform uh, to the world today, but also to um, give the uh, participants of the Biomimicry Academy cohort of 2019 and 2020 an audience and a platform for their final presentation. Let me briefly walk you through the one, next one and a half hours that we're going to spend together. We'll, we are just, we are part of, or we're in the midst of the welcome and uh, an introduction and uh, we'll follow up with an excerpt, an introduction to responsible innovation and biomimicry by the president of Biomimicry Germany, Germany Dr. Arne Pechstein, which is an excerpt of our online training course. So you will get a first-hand experience and impression of how the training in the future will look like. At 1820, 1825, we'll have the pleasure to review with some brief words um, the training program of 2019 and 2020 before we'll open up the stage to the presentations of the two projects, business sourced biomimicry projects that led to prototypes that will be implemented in the business and social innovation, innovation realm. And then finally, at 20 past seven, I have a pleasure to open up the Biomimicry Academy platform for I am Fabian Feutlinski, director and founder of Biomimicry Academy, and I have the pleasure today to have with me uh, my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Arne Pechstein, who's, um, as I said, president of Biomimicry Germany and brought Biomimicry from the US to Germany and to Europe in, 2000, in, in 2014. As well with us is Paul Hoffman, coordinator of the Biomimicry Academy and um, one of the driving forces behind bringing this online experience to you. Now, without much further ado, let me give you a short introduction into the Responsible Innovation Training at Biomimicry Academy with an excerpt from our learning course. Let me welcome you again to the Biomimicry Academy. I'm Fabian Feutlinska, founder and director of the Academy, and I'm very pleased to have you here as one of the future change makers of the people who will create the future because they can combine responsible innovation with inspiration sources with value creating frameworks and principles to bring it into application in business, in social innovation, in entrepreneurship. We designed this course of the Academy based on our own experience and the expertise of a global network of business experts, scientists, designers, social innovators and many more. The course will lead you through eight chapters and three modules and bring you from gathering inspiration by the best sources, which is technology, which is nature, which is social and economic systems, to designing future product services, systems and communication strategies and implement it in business models in the end. My dear colleague, Dr. Arne Pechstein, myself, other experts, from the respective fields will guide you through this course and add on chapters that give deep dives into certain topics. The essentials you're going to begin here are the entry points into a training program that leads you through a problem-based learning process until you can implement your own solution to your chosen or a company source or a business sourced problem. We are highly connected to other networks from regenerative business, biomimicry of course, um, circular economy, responsible innovation, more business driven or more technical fields. 
What we built here is not only a training course. It is first of all a learning platform so that can everybody who wants to teach or wants to learn can share or tap into the content that is provided by a great network of experts. Moreover, we enlarged this concept of learning to implement solutions in the social and economic realm. For this, we designed a co-creation platform, which is called Kubayam, and you will also get an introduction towards the end of this course. What we aim here is not to just form a platform or a social network, but to leverage co-creation and to incentivize collaboration instead of competition as the basis of a new kind of economy. And this is how we see the future, the next decade will develop and will bring upon a new kind of collaborative, of value-centered business and society. I will now guide you through the concept of our course to give you an idea what you can learn, how you can make the best out of this course. Now, before we start, let me share one thing that is close to my heart. We come from a decade where we were streamlined as people to fulfill functions for an economic-centered society. These times are over. What we do not need anymore is process-driven and robot-like education or working culture. We need people who are driven by a desire to change and who have the right skills for that. That includes the technical skills, of course, but more of the social skills and creativity and associated problem solving. This means you have to be driven by your own curiosity. You have to self-organize. You have to be willing to step out of your box, out of your comfort zone. This is not a bachelor's program. It's a university grade master's program, but quicker and more application focused. You come out here as an expert who can really make a change out there on the market and in society. It's not made for beginners. It's not made for people who just start with their studies. Combine what you've learned with the openness you learn here and the processes and the frameworks, put it all together and you will create something new, something great that is greater than anything you can learn out there or in this course because it's your own product. Hello and welcome to the chapter Success Strategies for a Better Future. How do we design a future that works? In this chapter, we will talk about the mega trends that we see globally and why we need to act. And second, we'll talk about what are the mechanisms and the dynamics of how we can react to them using hybrid thinking and the elements of responsible innovation. So one of the mega trends we see globally is digitalization. This has been around for many years already, but this is increasing exponentially. The impact it has is radical and we have hardly a perception of what it actually will do to our future. But we can use these dynamics as an opportunity and we'll cover this within the next chapters and modules. The second mega trend is urbanization. Already today, more than 50% of the global population lives in cities. And this number is going to increase massively within the next few years. And especially in the emerging economies, we see cities emerge of a scale that we have never witnessed before in human history. The third megatrend is climate change. We all know the anthropogenic effects of our actions on the planet. And that is something we have to act upon immediately. The next megatrend is a trend in consumer behavior. Especially younger generations do not appreciate as much ownership, but rather focus on access. So we're moving towards a sharing economy, which has massive implications on resource use, but also on how we do business today. And finally, we're moving away from a scarcity-based business model to an abundance-based business model. So more and more things are just there and we can use them and tap into this abundance 
which radically changes the way we do business and has implications again on resources and materials that we can use in a much more responsible way. Well, all these things are developing on an exponential scale. This is something though that we can hardly anticipate. We are not hardwired to think exponentially. We think in linear terms. What we see in this graph along this white line, this is how our mind works. This is how we can perceive and anticipate the future. So when we make predictions of how the world will be in the near future, we base our hypotheses and our assumptions on what we've experienced in the past. But because technology, social systems, human interactions develop along an exponential scale, we will increasingly be wrong with these predictions. So the gap between what we think will happen and what actually happens will grow wider and wider. And this is a huge challenge because alongside with that, complexity increases as well. So we cannot predict those systems, but we cannot control the systems either. So this requires an entire new mindset and an acquire new tool set to deal with the challenges of the 21st century. And that is something that we want to equip you with throughout the biomimicry practitioner education. The problem we're stuck with though is that we are stuck to and bound to 20th century mindset and 20th century principles. Yet we are immersed into the 21st century technologies and all these collaborative tools that we are using and immersed in. Now this creates a tension that we need to deal with. The challenge with this is that this not only has implications on how we use technology, but it has deep rooted implications on also how we handle materials, how we create business models and how we build our societies at large. As an example, you see here on the left side, an insect, a bee, and that complex organism is made up of pretty much in a simplified way, four polymer groups. What you'll find there, are proteins. Proteins are responsible for structure, are responsible for catalysis, are responsible for regulation and movement. What you also find is a polymer called chitin. Chitin is the second most abundant biopolymer after cellulose, which we find in trees. And this polymer is responsible for all insects to create the so-called exoskeleton. Insects do not have bones, a skeleton like we do, but they have this crunchy shell, which is made out of chitin. Then we have an energy carrier, this is glycogen, and we have information carriers, which is DNA and RNA. And these four polymer groups pretty much make up this entire complexity of this organism. Well, if we now on the right hand side look at products we build in the human made world, they are made of a larger and much bigger array of polymers. The problem with that is that A, they are produced under questionable conditions. So there are a lot of toxic byproducts in the process of synthesis. The second problem we see is that these products and systems we build are not built for disassembly. So hardly can we reuse these materials that we have produced in the first place. So whereas in this example of the B, all the materials go back into material cycle, most of our products currently cannot be reused and that is a challenge because materials are not abundant. The challenge we are facing is therefore by nature not an energy problem. Because in terms of energy, we are not experiencing a crisis. We are currently using wrong business models to harvest energy, but energy as such is abundant. If we look at the sun and the solar system, it provides way more energy than we can ever use on our planet. So using solar power could provide for all the energy needs we could potentially have on our planet. So in terms of energy, our planet is an open system. However, on the other side, looking in the material side of things, we are a closed system because materials are limited and finite on our planet. So if we destroy them, for instance, by burning them and uh, destroying them on landfills, then we cannot reuse them. And this is a big problem because with a finite resource growing exponentially or in an unlimited way as we do it currently in economy is something that is not possible. And just to give you a number, already today 
there is 30 times more gold in one ton of old mobile telephones compared to one ton of gold ore where the gold originally was sourced from. And this is crazy. We cannot continue with this procedures and with this mindset. We have to change something and that is something that we will teach throughout the biomimicry practitioner education. At the same time, using our exponential technologies, we are exploring new planets. We are going to the Mars and try to establish Earth-like colonies on different planets. Of course, at the same time, we're exploiting our planet and the resources we have and the beauty we have um, and use currently way more resources than we can sustain it within the planetary boundaries. So while, of course, using exponential technologies to do great things is something amazing and we should continue doing, we should not destroy our planet and rather be responsible and learn from this amazing system that we are part of. And that is something that will teach how we can leverage this and create abundance and create prosperity on our planet. Because today we're using four to five times more of the resources than our planet can sustain if everybody would live like the average European or US American. Now, obviously, with all these trends coming together, we see that tradition as such is not a business model. The values underlying certain traditions, they are important. But just because we have done things the way in the past, like we did them, is not a reason to continue doing them in the future. And many of those things that we have been doing in the 20th century will not lead us to success within this century. So the question then is, why with all that knowledge, don't we act now? And the reason, the deep-rooted reason why we have difficulties moving towards the needed actions is that we were all raised and conditioned in an old system. We're basically stuck in a conveyor belt mindset coming from a conveyor belt-like education. So when you look at education, even at large today, we're teaching young kids future generations who should be basically responsible innovators in a manner how we raised and educated kids 150 and 200 years ago. So how do we overcome these burdens? How do we move to the 21st century mindset and create tools and use tools that lead us into a prosperous future? And this is something that we call hybrid thinking. Hybrid thinking is the hybridization of different approaches that tackle exactly these challenges and start with the individual and with the direction we want to go, so it's value-based, and create systems and business ecosystems that are viable and that are responsible and value-creating. So hybrid thinking consists of four aspects. The first is what we call the transformative purpose. It's a direction, it's a strategy. These are the values. This is the why of your organization or the why of your intentions. Why do you want to go that way? Where do you want to go? What are the values you hold? And what is the strategy to achieve these values? The second aspect of hybrid thinking is mindset innovation. How do we transform individuals from this 20th century mindset to the 21st century mindset? How do we acknowledge and use and leverage all this creative and cognitive potential within human beings and bring it to the best of humankind, but also to the best of our planetary system. The third aspect of hybrid thinking is agile collaboration. Even if we leverage and harvest the potential of an individual, how do we make people to work together to harvest this crowd intelligence, this group intelligence that creates so much creativity and so much emergent power to create new systems? And finally, the fourth aspect of hybrid thinking is future business. How do we create business ecosystems that work, that create value and that leverage abundance and are not based on scarcity and competition? So hybrid thinking serves as a guiding framework for responsible innovation. Now, how do we make this actionable? And this is what we call the elements of responsible innovation. The first aspect of it is the human aspect, the human centered design. So what is the relevancy of why we're solving a problem? What is the need behind? What problem do we solve that is worth solving? And here we'll use various methods, including design thinking, looking at people's and humans' needs, abstracting what are their desires and their pain points and their needs, and bring them into the solution space. 
The second aspect, looking at those solutions, is where do we source these solutions and the ideas for potential solutions from? And this is where nature and biology comes into place. This is how we create sustainable systems using biomimicry and nature-inspired innovation. Because nature and biological systems throughout the course of millions and billions of years has developed strategies that solve problems radically differently at times than we do it currently. The third aspect and the third element of responsive innovation is then systems thinking and circular economy. So how do we create entire systems that are interacting with each other and functioning as a whole and not just as an isolated part? And here we apply systems and closed loop thinking. So an important thing is not only an individual solution, but thinking in a larger context. And this leads us to the fourth element of responsible innovation, which is business modeling. Because even if you think through a system and you have a great idea, an invention is not an innovation. So you need to implement it into the market and understand the dynamics of economics. And this is what we'll teach you throughout the Biomimicry Practitioner online education to learn how to create revenue models, how to tap into abundance, how to leverage stakeholder and ecosystems to build something that works, that creates value, and that creates a viable business. You will learn in especially the biomimicry section of this course that we don't only want to copy nature, we don't only want to extract information, but it's also about reconnecting to nature and seeing our, our own nature, the things that are inside ourselves, the values we hold dear and what we want to give back to the world. For this we need to be aware, we need to be conscious in everything we do, and we need to connect to ourselves and everything around us. This is not esoteric, it's a part of creating a real value for the, your surrounding. Once you've found a value giving product, service or system that you want to design, it's also about how you bring it to the market, how you bring it to the people, because only something that is taken up by stakeholders will eventually have the potential to change the mindset and the way we behave for a better. So this is part of our responsible innovation to lead you from an inspiration source through personal development towards a meaningful integration into business and society. So this was an introduction taken from the um, introduction section of the Biomimicry Practitioner Online Essentials. And it uh, gives the perfect background for uh, the, the um, inputs of the participants of the last cohort 2019-2020. But um, before we have the pleasure of uh, listening to the, the project presentations, I would like um, to welcome, first of all, the global biomimicry network who uh, joined us today, and especially representatives from uh, Germany, from Italy, from the Netherlands, from the Austrian network, and also from other global networks, especially from the US. Before we listen to the students who are shown here already, um, I would like to also especially welcome the president of Biomimicry Germany, Arndt Pechstein. He led, is the project lead or a program lead and one of the major um, yeah, content um, creators and educators we have here. So um, I hope that Arndt is already with us. I am, yes. Hello, Arndt. Hi, Fabian, um, and hello, everyone. A great pleasure to have you on this call tonight, or whatever time it is for you, depending on where you sign in from. Um, really great to have you all together here. Yeah, yeah, thank you for, for joining us. And um, so we heard um, 
the introduction and the background why it is so important to change. And we, um, you, you probably outlined already the uh, pillars that can lead this change. And one of the central aspects is biomimicry. And we at Biomimicry Academy want to take this nature inspiration as a, a tool of facilitate this um, yeah, highly needed change that we want to see in the world. Um, I'm, I'm very happy that we had such um, dedicated and energetic students with us for the first cohort. And um, maybe you can uh, give your impressions, Arndt, of uh, how you see the last yeah, nine months with these students. Yes, absolutely. So maybe first uh, to connect what we have been doing through the last nine uh, like uh, basically months and even before building up all these networks is something that so much uh, gained relevance in the past weeks and months. If you look at the current situation, what is happening right now, this uh, like insane global lockdown is uh, actually not a result of the virus, but a result of a flawed system. And that is something that we have been working on to basically create an alternative for a long time. And that is why biomimicry and bio-inspired innovation at large is uh, something that has a huge potential and will gain a huge momentum just now. Because what we're talking about right now in this crisis is really about how to adapt, how to create resilient strategies, how to be more sustainable. And going back to what we've just heard, in the uh, short input you've all seen is that we need a narrative, we need a vision. And we all experience firsthand, and that is unique in almost like the history of humankind, we all globally and collectively experience a possible vision of traveling less, of being more at home, spending more time with people, reflecting on what is really necessary and having a sufficient uh, and not an efficiency driven life only. So this is something that really uh, basically creates an even bigger need for these bio inspired approaches. And that's what we've been doing also in this curricul curriculum over the past month. And what we've been observing was uh, like an, a cohort of extremely enthusiastic students who have been diving into two challenges that we will see and hear about uh, in, in a few moments. And uh, they were really coming from various fields from uh, different countries, different backgrounds, and immersing into two totally different challenges. So one social challenge and uh, like more uh, like, uh, like concerning society, one more technical challenge, totally different uh, aspects, and yet using the same methodology and really diving into first, what are the needs, what are pain points, what are requirements, defining the problem, then looking into biology for solutions, where we had amazing inspirational exchanges, where we had experts uh, and disruptors as part of the process to basically look into what are those principles and strategies nature applies and how can they be abstracted until they eventually came up with solutions. And that is so exciting because these things are actually projects that are not just made for the cohort and for the program, but these are real world problems and real world challenges that will continue to be worked on in, like in the future. And that is exactly what is uh, so important and where we put so much emphasis in our program and, and beyond in all the work that we do with the Biomimicry Network is to bring um, the ideas, the prototypes and the, the concepts we develop with Biomimicry directly into application um, to not just keep it in the in the theoretical realm or also in the ideal realm but also to to test it against the circumstances of, of the market and of the uh, of society and of the world around us because this is where it needs to have an impact so um yeah thank you very much Arndt um for this reflection on the last month and um you stay with us for some uh, for some more minutes here in this webinar um, to, uh, and to, I'd like to invite you, especially, to um, ask questions uh, to the to the participants, and um, yeah, address the challenges that they took on with their projects. And um, talking about this, I'd like to also welcome the challenge owners, which are Alessandro Villa um, and Diane Derby. Um, and uh, I'd also like to invite you, especially, to address questions. So hello everybody and welcome to the presentation of our business challenge. 
We are Julia, Alessandro, and Natasha, and in the Biomimicry Academy, better known as the Mangrove Team. As we know, water is essential for agricultural production and food security. It is the lifeblood of ecosystems, including forests, lakes, and wetlands, on which our present and future food and nutritional security depends. Yet, our freshwater resources are decreasing at an alarming rate. Evidence suggests that two-thirds of the world population could be living in water-stressed country by, by 2025 if current consumption patterns continue. Agriculture is both a major cause and casualty of water scarcity. Farming accounts for almost 70% of all water withdrawals and up to 95% in some developing countries. We will have to use our natural resources more wisely. If we consider that about 70% of Earth's surface is covered in water, only 3% of all the water on Earth is fresh water. Of that small amount of fresh water, almost 2% is locked up in glaciers and ice at the North and South Poles, and less than 1% of fresh water is, most, is mostly groundwater. That means that the rest 97% of the Earth's water is held by oceans in the form of saline water. So, why don't we use it? Planet for example, is facing this challenge with the development of a desalination device, the mangrove steel. So let me spend just a few words about Planet. Planet is a startup specialized in bio-inspired design for sustainable innovation. It has been founded by Alessandro Villa and Alessandro Bianciardi in 2013. And although different expertise and professional background, both of them are into biology, complex biology systems, and bio-inspired technology. They both took part in a specific educational program at the Biomimicry Institute in San Francisco. And moreover, Planet is the owner of the business, the business challenge we are presenting today. The mangrove steel, it is a passive, low-cost, modular, bio-inspired solar distiller, able to produce fresh water from seawater or highly concentrated salt water, and it is based on the two elementary physical principles of evaporation and condensation. Planet is developing the mangrove steel in order to help communities living in coastal degraded islands to irrigate and prompting reforestation projects using not conventional water resources and therefore to contribute to the fight against water scarcity and the desertification intensified by the climate changes. Planet, in the context of our Biomimicry Academy, requests us to redesign the mangrove steel desalination unit to allow modular production and reliable assembly. Briefly, I'm going just to present the team who took part in this challenge. So we have Natasha, she's an architect working in Germany. She focuses on sustainable building solutions as well as digitalization in the construction industry. Alessandro, he is a design engineer at Planet and he focuses on bio-inspired design for environmental and industrial solution. And Julia, which is me, I'm an environmental engineer with more than five years of experience in aquatic biology and I'm also part of the R&D team for bio-inspired solution at Planet. As you can see, we all come from different backgrounds, but we all share the passion for natural systems and bio-inspired technology. In the next slide, we would like to show the process we have learned and used to get through the challenge. It is inspired to the double diamond approach, which is probably the most popular design process visualization. Beside the description of the different phases of the process, the main feature of the double diamond it is its emphasis on the divergent and convergent thinking. In the next slide, uh, following the process we just described, we needed first of all to get a better understanding of the challenge. For this reason, we used a semantic analysis to expand the meaning of it. In the picture, you can see the deconstruction of the semantic of the challenge sentence. Moreover, we moved to analyze the mangrove steel technology in order to have a better understanding of the product itself. 
the process, the components, and the materials. After that, we were able to define some design constraints. We needed to consider for our challenge, and here you can see a list of them. So for instance, the desalination unit has to be redesigned with a modular architecture, and it has to be waterproof, and so on. Afterwards, that was important also to define the whole stakeholders. In the process, we identified different internal and external players, as you can see in our map. But after providing enough information about each of them, we considered the fablets, the stakeholder, with the highest impact of the assigned challenge. Especially in terms of manufacturing process and material in this pers perspective of a decentralized production. For their implicit structure, Fab Labs bring with them a series of constraints here listed, mainly related to available technologies, processable materials, size part, and so on. At the end, we also defined uh, the definition of the value proposition help us to better understand the challenge we were facing. With our product, we reduce the dependence of local farmers on conventional water resources. We reduce the water cost thanks to the decentralized passing desalination system based on the use of seawater and solar irradiation. We provide a scalable system according to the local needs, and we complete the agroforest emission, prompting its practice using conventional water resources. Eventually, the value proposition design, together with the design constraints, were used to identify the function used for the biological research later described. I pass the words to my colleague, Alessandro. Yes, here I am. Uh, thank you, Jerry. So uh, we're, sorry for the, okay. So uh, here is uh, where basically the, uh, the human-centered design steps uh, ends. And I mean, even if you need to consider uh, the whole process as an iterative process, uh, of course, e here is where we jump uh, into the biological world, into the biomimicry approach. So first of all, we reframe the challenge, uh, including two uh, keywords, actually two functions uh, that to achieve uh, with the desalination unit. And here you can see is modular and foldable. So what we want to achieve, uh, unit and or foldable so with these two function then entered to the uh, discovering phase that's really the, the biological work and we started to wonder how does nature like create foldable structure or modular elements or still how to arrange or make foldable structure and modular elements and uh, thanks to a series of tools like Ask Nature or, or uh, reading uh, scientific papers are able to uh, identify a list of things and study them, like studying their function, mechanism, and strategies. And uh, thanks to this list, we were then able to identify our uh, biological analogy. And this is the of stomach uh, member. This is the uh, organisms, uh, let's call it, that we focus and uh, exploring and studying the, the stomach membrane, membrane we uh, understood uh, the strategies actually that allow it to be folded. So to have like the configuration you can see in the picture basically. And there are uh, three strategies that can be summarized as the tight junction, the morphogenesis and the sculptoid shape. And we went into detail trying to understand the uh, behind uh, these strategies. And we focused mainly on the strict, you can see like on the upper part of the slide. And uh, so that's allowed us to understand better the, uh, the mechanism indeed. So basically uh, you have to imagine the, um, the stomach membrane as a, a patterned uh, flat organic tissue where the pattern itself is made of the cells but it's thanks to that pattern that the stomach membrane is flexible and is uh, able to, uh, to gain uh, 3D uh, complex uh, configurations. So 
we took this understanding and we extrapolated what we can call like design principles. And from understanding, basically we uh, jumped from the biological world back to the technical side, back to the uh, yeah, technical world again. And we, uh, defined our, we defined our, basically wanted to um, explore like a panel, uh, a pattern panel uh, that could, could like shape in 3D complex configuration. Thanks indeed to, uh, to that pattern geometries. Uh, so uh, then we moved to, to the prototype uh, step. We basically uh, explored some materials, trying to understand their uh, plasticity, trying to understand their elasticity. But basically what was uh, really understanding in, in this, uh, we were able to reach different 3D configuration according to the pattern uh, itself that we were able to imprint on the panel. And another uh, important aspect that uh, led us to proceed on the on the path uh, was uh, whether uh, like external references like for example the wood skin uh, that you that, that is like a, a double plywood panel with the stomerical leg uh, but that thanks to the pattern uh, they were able to uh, you know to provide to this plywood like fixed flexibility and here is like a concept summary. I pass the, the word to uh, Natasha. Yeah, okay. thanks Alessandro. So after this stage of the process, we had a better understanding of what modularity really meant. We wanted to summarize our findings for the next stage and to keep reminding ourselves um, which are our key goals. So basically we wanted to remember that this is a single unit, a whole unit that should be or could be divided into subunits. An important factor was the ability to have different 3D configurations that can be adapted according to the site. And another aspect to explore was the use of one material. So building up from the first design phase, we decided to look at the Voronoi pattern. The Voronoi pattern was actually something that we already discovered during one of our biological research processes. And we thought maybe a biological pattern could give us more information on how to further develop a design. Voronoi can be found in all aspects in nature, many in, for example, in leaves, reptile skin, and the pattern can help solve geometric problems like packing, strategic placements, and patterns of growth. So in the next slide, you see just a quick understanding of Voronoi. Imagine a large field, and on this field, there are a number of fires that are set on it simultaneously and they all spread in all directions at the same rate. So the Voronoi diagram describes both the location of, of which these fires are set, meaning the Voronoi site point, and the boundaries at which adjacent fires meet, meaning the Voronoi region. So basically Voronoi has an important property of understanding spatial relationships, adjacencies, and neighborhoods. Throughout our research, we came across a study done by, by MIT that combines origami folding techniques with the Voronoi pattern. This technique actually uses a different strategy for folding a material to make a polyhedron, which is a 3D shape with flat polygonal faces. The origa original origami folding method seen on your left is called the strip method. And this is a combination of folding, including weaving, and dividing the material into strips. This method is, however, inefficient because it's unable to create a scaled version of a polyhedron and it wastes a lot of material. The new algorithm seen on your right has no holes, no gaps, no slits in its internal boundary. This makes it watertight. In the next slide, you see um, how this algorithm is defined. It's pretty complex. Basically, you map the facet of the des desired polyhedron onto a flat surface. This facet will be touching each other once the folding is complete, but in reality, they can be quite far from each other on the flat surface. The trick is to fold away the extra material in order to bring together the faces of the polyhedron together. And this can be seen in the second and third method called the tuck proxy waffle method. The fold 
Holding away of the extra material process can be very complex and involves hundreds of individual creases in order to calculate the most efficient crease pattern and reduce it to a minimum. This is where the Voronoi diagram comes to play. The boundaries created by the Voronoi diagram is what defines the creases of the algorithm. In the next slide, you see a video that shows um, this, that shows the algorithm being used. So here you see a 3D object and you, you can unroll the object and you see the different pieces as well as the crease patterns. Underneath you see the waffle foldings and once a facet is selected you see that it is not exactly lying adjacent to the next facet. In the next video you see that um, this is a basic Voronoi diagram with four points and the red lines that constitute the Voronoi um, arcs then cause the folding of the uh, 3D object. In the next slide, you see the program once again, um, how we can imagine using different geometrical solutions um, that we can imagine for the unit. So after our research, we found that this, um, by using these tools and this algorithm, there's really a, a reduced need for to transport a physical product as everything shall be, um, let's say, digitally produced or can be transferred to files, which then can be later um, produced, uh, decentralized in a fab lab. The methods also do not use uh, molds. They can be rather created using CNC, laser or 3D printing. And through using this algorithm, we can provide different uh, configurations and shapes. As for further investigations, we would like to explore different polyhedron shapes for the unit, using the program to then identify an efficient folding pattern using the Voronoi. We would then use a CNC machine to test out these findings. We could consider um, shape memory uh, in terms of materiality. We could consider shape memory alloys as well as methods of 4D printing. And this is really to make sure that the unit is programmable in the sense that it can adapt to a local condition, be it space or temperature. The unit can be more flexible and more attuned to be more dynamic. For example, with the shape memory alloy, it responds really well to thermal conditions and has a kinetic response, meaning that it extends or compresses according to the heat. In the end, we imagine um, similar configurations as seen here. Using this algorithm and using the knowledge that we have acquired right now, we see vast opportunities that we could use, leaving a lot of source of inspiration of how we imagine the unit to be produced in the next stage. Thank you. Well, thank you um, for this great presentation on a very exciting project and uh, that addresses again pretty much what we've been talking about before by saying um, we want to not only use by inspiration for the sake of it but to bring it into application so thank you very much um, so the floor is open for questions maybe i'll start right away so you have um very yeah well outlined um your concept from from taking the the, the idea from low tech with maybe the wood skin like uh setting towards a high tech by using uh the voronoi algorithm <clears throat> now a question i got online is um do you use the mangroves still already or what are um contemporary um, methods for desalination. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Fabian, and thank you, whoever. Um, yeah, actually, the the mangrove still is um, a planet project. Um, I don't know if uh, Alessandro Villa is here with us, uh, but he's the co-founder yes. of 
Okay. I'm here. Okay. I'm here. Okay. Hello, hello, everybody. Alexander. Okay. Hello, 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 hello. Go ahead, Ale. You can. Okay. You can explain. Thanks. So, so basically, yeah. Um, the mangrove steel is uh, currently uh, is currently used. Actually, uh, it's it's ready. It has already been tested uh, uh, a couple of times. Actually, with uh, two pilot tests, once in Cyprus and one in. Uh, uh, in the north part of uh, Italy, and and it's uh, going to be tested again with a let's say a third pilot in uh, in in Greece. Uh, like it was supposed to be this summer actually, but now it's it's going to be postponed uh, because I mean you know the reason. Um, and that's actually a really basic uh, desalination process. It's it's based on uh, evaporation condensation. Uh, triggered by the sun uh, irradiation, uh, so it can be really considered like a passive uh, desalination uh, strategy. Cu currently, I mean, it's uh, worldwide. It's not, of course, the most uh, common technology because uh, basically the, the efficiency is not uh, that high. Uh, normally, uh, like countries uh, use uh, reverse osmosis uh, processes that is based on membrane filtration, let's say. Uh, but the point is that these uh, uh, like huge uh, plants, industrial plants are uh, really uh, energy demanding and require like, a lot of uh, initial investments um, and are not, uh, cannot be considered as decentralized um, technologies. While the concept of the mangrove steel is in, in, indeed to be uh, decentralized, uh, low low tech, let's say technology, and uh, and mainly to be modular, we, 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 which means that you can uh, enlarge it and, and scale it according to the uh, to the local needs. So based based on the yeah on the water demand of the of the context. I I, I make a big uh, overview, so I I hope I, I reply to the answer. Yeah, no, that was great, absolutely. Um, Alessandro Villa, uh, welcome from my side as well. As a church owner, um, do you have a question to the team? Uh, okay, um, um, hello again. So, uh, first of all, co my compliment, because honestly, this is the, the first time I, I saw the, the outcome of, of your work, and I'm, I'm quite proud of, of it. And um, um, yeah, there is there is uh, uh, maybe I have not now right now a, a question, but uh, honestly, hearing the presentation, I I'm I'm quite confident we could move uh, forward with uh, in in this direction. Um, well, basically, one one of the points will be to apply. Uh, this, how to say, this uh, design system to uh, the specific material or uh, utilizing a material with the proper mechanical uh, properties. And um, uh, we, we now choose the thermoforming process to produce uh, the, the salination units because we, we were able to find, how to say, a good compromise between the price and the mechanical properties, because this material has to last at least 130 degrees. And, and so I'm, I'm, I'm very curious, I'm very curious to, 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 to work together to, to find out a material able to last the needed mechanical properties, uh, but also workable with, with, uh, with the CNC machining according to the algorithm. Yes. Yeah, this is my first comment. Yes, yes. Yeah, thank you for that. And um, so, yeah, what you see is uh, from every result, there will be new challenges coming up. Now, uh, one question um, that was asked online is, what was your biggest challenge um, during the project? And maybe connected with this, another question, what was the biggest paradigm shift you, um, you realized while you were working on the project?
so that goes out yeah. to the project team <laughs> okay yeah, yeah i guess i guess so um can you can 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 you tell me again the first question I I miss it? What was the biggest challenge you faced um, in the project? The the biggest challenge uh, was um, really two uh, two two biggest challenge I would say. Uh, the first was to uh, and and this like the um, uh, semantic analysis. So it was really to understand uh, some kind of keywords uh, that were crucial and critical for then develop the project so really to understand what like for example modularity or uh, was what, what was the, the meaning of modularity for the uh, challenge owner so what was the wish at the end that's what was the first um, uh, problem let's say and second one was really to uh, go deep in the you know biological research because the vocabulary generally speaking is really uh, different uh, from the, I mean, uh, from at least the one I'm, I'm, I was used to. So, like the collaboration with biologists and some some experts were crucial to, you know, uh, districate the the complexity of the biological research. Yeah, thank you very much. And um, you pointed it out um, very nicely. One of the most important phases is actually the the first one in the process is the understanding phase because it sets the ground for everything that comes after. And moreover, you always go back, right? Whenever you have an answer, there will be new questions arising that you will need to um, record, reconsider, rephrase, and then research. So um, yeah, with this, I'd like to thank you and uh, the project, the whole project team again for this great presentation. And um, yeah, everybody out there for the questions. And uh, I would like to move on to the second project team, which is which consists of uh, Renat, Hannah, and Sylvia. Okay, so hi everybody, thanks for being here. Our team is going to talk about fostering symbiotic relationships with bio-inspired innovation. And we focus it on museums and community creating lasting social body together. Next slide, please. We are Hannah, Renata, and myself, Sylvia. We are participants of the Biomimic Academy and we developed this project in conjunction with the Air Museum. Next slide, please. First of all, we would like to take you back to the last museum experience you had or ask you about it. What was it like? How were you with? Who were you with, sorry? What was the most memorable part of the experience? Did you feel connected? And was it memorable? Next slide, please. With that previously stated, now I wanted to spend our challenge established that we are museums and the Biomimic Academy. It was to redesign the way a museum processes information from the public and vice versa. Here, we identify our key stakeholders by breaking down the challenge statement and creating a system map. In the statement, museums are identified as a stakeholder, but through our research, we determined that public could be defined into two similar but distinct groups, the neighborhoods and the communities. Next slide, please. Well, historically, museums have been defined as institutions that converse collections of artifacts and items of importance. Many public museums are also make these items available for viewing or that is mostly what are they known for. Our neighborhoods consist they are individuals living between a defined geographical space near a museum, for example. However, communities are not confined by a physical or spatial unit. This means that communities are a mix of individuals and neighborhoods that exist locally, nationally, and even globally. They can interact through physical or virtual means. Next slide, please. Following, we did some surveys to understand more of our, stake, of our stakeholder. Next, please. Through our research, we found that many people had issues with this historical concept of a museum. These people are artists, curators, and decision makers in the museum hierarchy. They are also people with disabilities, members of virtual communities, and members of climate action movements, and more. The beauty of these interviews was that no matter with which community these people identify, they are always a part of several communities. For example, the curators are part of a neighborhood, 
and may be a part of a virtual community as well. In addition, they can take part in climate action movements. Thanks to this, thanks to this case over into many different communities, we found these issues were not exclusive to one individual or group of people. Next. Thank you. We also identified concerns about what items and media are being collected and conserved. Who is making these decisions and what biases exist in the decision-making process? So we asked ourselves, should collection and conservation still be at the core of museum practice and perception? Additionally, we ask, what resources are necessary or key to the development of the museum and its content? Financial and material resources are generally considered, but what about the people of the museum as a resource? What about the people outside the museum, the neighborhoods, and the members of its external community? Our interviewers also question the accessibility of a museum and their collections. Is the context accessible to everyone? Is some or all the context accessible everywhere? Is a museum accessible to the neighborhoods and surrounding community? Some people also felt that museums were boring, that they cost too much, and that they didn't fit to the self-defined stereotype mold of who visit the museums. Many also felt underrepresented by the type of content that the museum were displayed. Some of these issues may be difficult to some for our last long established museums, but that doesn't mean that changes can be made or that there are museums and organizations that are looking to change perception and disrupt their part. Next, please. Following, we did an analysis of museums that are taking actions and disrupting the paradigms by making museums more relevant and approachable for the neighborhoods and community. Next, please. We chose one to represent here today. The topic was the useful museum, which lecture was made by Alisa Hudson, director of the Middle Spread Institute of Modern Art in the United Kingdom. Here, he introduced Middle Spread as a forgetting place, which has no marking, no marking value, so there were no people left behind in the town due to the migration. So it became a relocation center for the Migration Control Center and a place for major communities. Because of its complexities, the model of a museum in this kind of place does not work. Thank you. Then he was looking how to make art work, and he found in John Ruskin, who said, art should be a part of a social change. So Hudson was trying to resurrect the museum by, the guy, by this guy and taking the principle that a happy society is a productive society. For this, they make a committee which turned the museum into the Museum of Arte Util, or Useful Art, and introduced the term Museum 3.0. Next, please. To clear this term, it is important to speak a bit of the vision and the history he followed. He defined the first identity of museum as Museum 1.0 as a Victorian model where people displayed objects just for others to see. The second identity of the museum, Museum 2.0, as the night is great art, where people can engage, but in the end is someone's, someone else's agenda. So the new term, Museum 3.0, will be a place where museums and society contribute as one. Next, please. To deliver that, they established the next main point. Identify the history of the town, show crowd source, allow people to build during the show and not just a final presentation. Learn into making, have a studio where people can do and learn again. Here they use pottery in this case, so they feel relatable to the history of the town. Allow people to choose what is displayed and have exhibition made by that community. Next, please. From all this, what we took as a relatable to our challenge was the re that concepts. As he followed John Ruskin with art should be used for social change, we took the inspiration and believe it is time to give a usable value of nature for interconnection of museums and communities. Next, please. To continue, I would like to briefly introduce the concept of bio inspiration or biomimicry. What is it and how does it factor into our process solution? Next. Thank you. Let me read a quick definition from the biomimicry resource handbook. Biomimicry is learning from and then emulating natural forms, processes, and ecosystems to create more sustainable design. Next, please. So here we focus on 
What would nature do here? How it would confront our challenge? What can we learn from the nature to introduce into social patterns? Next, please. These and all the questions asked during the process are focused on this nature approach. A swift support is based on nature as a mentor, nature as a model, and nature as a master. So now I pass the word to my friend, Raina. Okay, I was speaking while it was muted. So when we started uh, looking at the challenge, uh, we saw museums and we saw community and we saw information as the link between both. Uh, so we looked at information in terms of learning and dissemination for the museums and in terms of knowledge and production for the community. When we started looking at uh, learning, uh, we looked, we delved into several organisms, and then uh, we ended up with only the mycelium. We focused on the mycelium. Why? Because it's uh, holistic and it's comprehensive. And uh, in the mycelium, we started asking all these biomimetic questions about what, how, why, when, where, to what end, to come up with the mechanisms and the strategies. And from there, we reached to the um, forest ecosystem. Okay. And uh, when we reached the forest ecosystem, we realized that that's what inspired uh, the concept of symbiosis. Conceptually, the forest starts with a seed. The individual seed, uh, it grows and it actually wants to reach upwards toward the sun. While it's trying to go upwards, it's also rooting itself into the soil. While it's also going upward, it's becoming leaves and uh, the leaves become a tree to concentrate uh, the carbon in the air using the sun energy and the photosynthesis and to grow more. In the meanwhile, the roots are under the soil are becoming, are growing and becoming a network. The question is why? Obviously the tree also needs more nutrients from the soil, the NPK, the nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium. And uh, the tree alone cannot uh, obtain these uh, nutrients in their basic forms. It cannot, it cannot extract them. So what happens is that it uh, looks for alliances. And alliances with whom then, or with whom? It turns out that there's also the fungus uh, network, which is the mycelium, that's also, hold on, let me get the pointer. Okay. So the mycelium, which is the fungus uh, root network, is also creating a whole network under the soil. But it's, since it's a fungus, it's um, parasitic in its nature. So what it does is that it actually mobilizes the insects to um, dissolve or to, to extract the nutrients from the topsoil and to use them. Now, when the while the trees need uh, these nutrients, the fungus need the carbon, the sugar concentrated from the trees. So that's where the exchange happens. And the exchange usually happens between, between both the fungus network, root network, and the tree's root network under the soil at the root ends of both, which is the hyphae. So this alliance between both uh, results into trees, forests, uh, with all kinds of components that fosters different kinds of organisms. To understand what is this alliance and what, is, what are these relationships, we look into all the contributors and the components of this. Uh, so there are the under the ground, there are the community of decomposers or insects, there are all this network of roots, and there are all the nutrients that are uh, dissolved uh, through the, uh, with, the with the decomposition. And then above the ground, there are also the nutrients in the air. There's the air uh, with the different skins uh, or atmospheres. Um, there's the energy. And then there's also uh, the temperature, the seasons that stimulate the different growth. So from there, we, we understand that uh, while there's the ground, 
and above the ground where the structure happens and which is the forest in that sense what we admire what we appreciate but this entire structure is a resultant of a whole lot of action that's happening below ground the infrastructure and uh, all together um, decide what happens above the ground decide on this growth and these questions actually stimulate the other kind of questions the what where who whom when in our uh, in the abstract form in the museum form to decide how does a museum communicate with its neighbors and in a more a little bit more detailed in the network of, uh, below ground also there are all these nodes and interconnections that also a lot, of, a lot happens in terms of exchange. Moreover, that this uh, underground network uh, of roots, it grows horizontally because everything is mostly in the topsoil, but it also happens that the width of this uh, network also informs the height of the above structure. That also means that we need to question um, in terms of structures, size, and what kind of actions, interactions, and reactions need to happen, what kind of information, and what are these nodes and intersections. Now I pass it to Hannah. Thank you. Um, so in translating the biology, we identified the key elements of the forest ecosystem and how they could be interpreted in a social context. Next slide, please. Um, for instance, the trees, um, we interpreted to be the museums and next are the leaves where information can be processed information is a broad term that we use to describe artifacts cultural practices ideas and anything else that has been or is being created and exchanged the information processed in the leaves is generally coming from external sources like neighborhoods and communities and processed somewhere in the museum in nature photosynthesis is the process of transforming one kind of energy to another as a result of photosynthesis, the leaves produce sugar and oxygen. In social terms, this energy is information, and as defined before, um, is transformed to generate a new form of information. For a museum, this could be the reorganization of information presented as exhibits or hosting events and workshops to create community engagement and exchange ideas. But this can't happen without a connection to external neighborhoods and communities. Next slide, please. Yeah. Which is where, where mycelium comes into play. Mycelium is the vegetative part of a fungus that consists of a network of small branching tubes. Because the mycelium is often found on and in soil, it connects to the plants via the plant's roots. Mycelium can be understood to be part of the social infrastructure, which includes the neighborhoods and communities. These points of connection for the trees and the mycelium are wherever the museums and neighbors and communities connect be it at the museum, in the community, or even virtually. The nutrients and the water that are transferred at these connection points are coming from the tree, but also from the soil and environment absorbed by the hyphae or small tubes of the mycelium. Because the mycelium is more efficient at absorbing water and nutrients from the soil than trees, a symbiotic or mutually beneficial relationship is established with the trees to exchange the nutrients and water. So the nutrients from the soil can be understood as ideas and information of the world that enter the social infrastructure along with people who are represented by water. The people carry these ideas and information through the neighborhoods and communities and exchange these ideas and information with museums. Which brings us to our concept. Next slide, please. So, with our concept, we are developing a nature-inspired social innovation guidebook for museums to engage with their neighbors and communities on a symbiotic basis to address these issues of accessibility and representation and to achieve the co-creation of social value. This guidebook will include three sections, the first of which is a section about symbiotic relationships and social value, what these terms mean and how they can be created and developed. The next section is for museums to reflect on their current relationship with neighbors and communities and use the ecosystem template we are developing to give intangible social concepts a tangible model. The final section is related to the integration of life's principles 
and will act as an audit for museums to identify how sustainable their current practices and goals are and to help determine what sustainable principles are important to the museum. Using the forest ecosystem graphics and the translation of biology into social terms, museum employees can begin a discussion about the key points of the social ecosystem, specifically the relationship of museums to their neighbors and communities. We will now demonstrate an exercise from the guidebook. Next slide, please. So the question we'll start with is where does the transfer of nutrients occur in the forest ecosystem? So this occurs in our example between trees and mycelium, where the nutrients that are gathered or produced are exchanged at points where the tree's roots connect to the mycelium. Next slide, please. So, one second, please. Uh, translated, these connection points are where the museum connects to the neighbors and communities and where both transfer ideas and information. The question for museums then becomes, can you identify these points of transfer between your museum and your neighbors and communities? Where are these points of connection? The museum could be considered a point where information and ideas are transferred, but are there any points in the neighborhood or community that the museum is connected to? Are these connections established with, the, with organizations like community or cultural centers or schools? Are these connections in person and or virtual? How do these connections evolve over time? As we said earlier, we can't determine the answers to these questions, but we hope that the activities provided in the guidebook will aid museums in developing their connection to the neighbors and communities. Next slide, please. So our motivation to pursue projects like these uh, can be identified also in three parts. We believe that nature is an ultimate mentor and humans and their artifacts primarily originated and evolved in nature. With time, many humans lost their internal connection to nature and we have the dedication and passion to regain that original connection. In practicing and deepening this connection, we are concerned about the environment and not only the natural environment, but also the built and social environments that we all share. Learning from nature and its millennia of evolutionary problem solving means we are open to new ways of addressing problems. And in addressing these problems from new angles, we can act on issues related to sustainable social change, including the creation and development of highly connected functional communities. Next slide, please. So uh, what and who supports us in this project? We definitely go to nature for support because it has been problem solving and evolving for 3.8 billion years. But not only does nature draw um, from a deep well of knowledge, but we have the we've had the opportunity to work with and receive support from several experts of biomimicry um, and museum development communities. These experts include Diane Druby and Sandro Devineau from We Are Museums, who connected with the Biomimicry Academy to propose projects like this one and met with us regularly to develop this project, and Asha Singhal, who acted as an advisor with knowledge of both the museum and biomimicry worlds, and from the Biomimicry Academy, Arndt, Fabian, and Paul, who guided us through the process of creating and developing a biomimetic concept. Next slide, please. Moving forward, we will continue to develop this guidebook and hope to start testing the exercises with museums in the near future. Next slide, please. In addition to receiving feedback and developing the guidebook with museums, we would be interested in hosting workshops with museums to work with them through the process. We would also be interested in aiding in the creation and development of information transfer points, be it physical and virtual locations, and or events to get museums and communities co-creating and talking about their issues. This concept has the potential for widespread social application and our team looks forward to working with anyone interested in applying the concept in new social contexts. Thank you. Well, thank you, first of all. What an, what an awesome presentation. And I can, uh, yeah, can only repeat what, uh, what also the, the people in the chat um, here probably to this presentation said already. What an awesome project and the great, um, great work. So uh, thank you very much. And um, yeah, we talked about already there are people standing by to use this guidebook that you want to develop in their consultancy and uh, museum related work. So um, yeah, this, uh, the, the floor is open for questions. We received plenty of questions online. We do not have time to answer or to ask them all, 
But um, maybe let me start with a question. Where did you draw your inspiration from? So is that, um, is that mainly literature search or um, how was your connection to the biological hands-on research? So um, we definitely started by looking, um, looking online with Ask Nature and reading several books. It was mostly um, sifting through information generally online um, to kind of understand our, our process a bit better and, um, and what we were going for. Uh, okay. So maybe I can, this is Arne speaking, I can add also, um, the inspiration was sort of manifold, and that was also uh, what the teams enjoyed, but also brought the teams to such a depth of uh, science and biological inspirations. First of all, we were working in collaboration with the Natural History Museum in Berlin. So we actually had two of our in-person sessions, the most critical ones, at their museum. So we were able to go through the exhibitions. We had guides from the museum to address certain questions, to focus their tours uh, for certain purposes. Then we had advisors and scientists, specialists who helped with uh, certain topics. And uh, finally, we also, and the teams actually did an amazing job in not only looking into Ask Nature, asknature.org, which is a, a database of uh, basically uh, case studies and biological principles curated by the Biomimicry Institute in the US, but they also really went into academic research and scientific papers, which again came from our scientific community, also from our history, Fabian and Mainz from science. So we had really a diversity of access points to get deep into research and biology. Okay, thank you very much. Um, another question online um, that is more maybe conceptual when talking about biomimicry, but I'd like to hear your opinion now as um, the upcoming biomimicry specialists um, or experts here. Um, where do you see the most value of biomimicry? Is it uh, rather in the technological application or in social innovation like you worked on? So for us, we obviously focused on the social aspect. Um, there were discuss discussions regarding the technological aspects as well, um, but we didn't focus on them as much. Um, there are other uh, relevant projects happening now. We are just a part of a larger project um, and that the other parts of the project could be uh, focusing more on the te technological side. But I mean, it goes both ways. Um, it's there's obvious social applications with our research but there are definitely technological ones as well if if i can add hannah i think that at the end do you hear me yeah yeah i think that at the end it doesn't matter which point uh are we, as we said in our concept we or our motivation things why we're doing this is for the environmental concert not just as nature but what's happening but at the end, you can see that both projects, one is technical, one is social, and the end, both end with great results. So that's why we're trying to do these things. And I think that's why everyone here is. But also your question, when you ask about technological, do you ask about the physical uh, form or technology in terms of communication and media? Um, well, this question was asked by Carlos Dulanto online. So yeah. if, if you are with us, Carlos, you can you can add to that question. Otherwise, um, I think uh, what what Sylvia said in the end um, was was quite telling. It's there is uh, there is always an interplay between social innovation and technology, and this is exactly also where the strength of biomimicry is because we address it from different different sides and uh, we can address maybe the same function with a technological solution but also with the social innovation. Do you want to add something there? I just wanted to actually say that uh, while you when you start in the social even when you start in the social um, research uh, or social biomimicry it informs the form and that's what um, we were trying to show is that yes we started the uh, on a social level or in a community, but it also tells you that the form is uh, constructed by the, net, the social network, the social aspects, uh, the, the symbiosis in turn, as a concept. How far can it go? It also tells you 
uh, how big can you grow? And uh, there was a lot, uh, when we delved into the research, there was a lot about the whole issue of growth and uh, what informs growth and what's the limit of growth. And um, it's, it's very philosophical, but growth is also physical and uh, that can apply to buildings and the museums in particular. Uh, in a neighborhood, for example, stuff like that, but that requires further research anyhow. Well, yeah, what you see is what what we also have seen from the other presentation before is that uh, you never you never stop asking the questions right and what you found out is um, yes, the food for for further development and uh, like going down from levels of asking like is a museum really a physical space that was a question that you were dealing with a lot. Um, and, and which kind of communication, um, well, concepts uh, could replace physical uh, solutions. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. For time reasons, I would um, like to close this, this question session and um, thank both teams for this great these great presentations again. I would like to use the last five minutes to open up the Biomimicry Academy online platform. As we've heard in the introduction, the responsible innovation education in the Academy comprises of four pillars and starts with human-centered design, with the design thinking process, and more generally speaking, the double diamond. The center at core of the whole education is based on the biomimicry and nature-inspired innovation process and framework. Um, and it leads over towards systems thinking and the most practical approach to it is the circle economy, which, which combines biomimicry with uh, business modeling on the other side, on the other, on the other end. Now in the business section in the last part, we integrate all these learnings and the concepts into actual application on the market or in social innovation um, with the frameworks of exponential organizations, this classical business modeling um, that leads towards communication and um, community integration. I'd like to mention that we operate in a global network of uh, biomimicry and um, nature inspired and research institutions most prominently the European Biomimicry Alliance, the Biomimicry Institute in the US, um, the Natural History Museum here in Berlin, and of course, uh, the center of all our activities, the brain and people power of Biomimicry Germany. Now the Biomimicry Practitioner Online Essentials is the training program that part of the Biomimicry Practitioner training that is completely online and self-paced. It comprises of three modules. The first module uh, consisting of three chapters and uh, having a learning content of um, about 30 hours total, which you can go through in a self-paced manner. And we open up this module today. The second module has again three, sep three, three chapters with the same setup and leads from um, human-centered design and biomimicry over to systems thinking, to circle economy, and then apply biomimicry to a challenge. We open up this module one month later, in May 4, 2020. And finally, the third module consists of two chapters, um, the first one being uh, business modeling, and the second one um, having uh, to one aspect, uh, or addressing aspects of communication um, and go-to-market processes and, and skills, um, but also community integration. And we open this again one month later at 1st of June. It's not only an education program and you're not left alone. What Biomicro Academy is a platform um, having add-on courses, but also a mentorship program. So join our weekly office hours when you participate in the academy or when you have questions um, that you would like to have answered before you start the academy. Now, the online essentials are the entry points into the Biomem Practitioner Certification Program, and the second part of this program is the project training. It will be online as well, but having on site aspects that are optional and add certain uh, benefits of uh, doing research on site to 
and, and the immerse into nature and uh, to connect to the community in Berlin. Now, this second part of the program is meant really for entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs and social innovators in general. And it goes from scoping your own goal and research your users in the first place to create sustainable solutions using the human-centered design and the biomimicry process and everything you've learned in the online essentials uh, to finally create your business and uh, take your ideas e even either um, towards pitching them in a company or bringing it to the market and communicate it and come up come out with a marketable minimal viable product now two things i'd like to mention on top of this is that um, we will set up a biomicro academy global philanthropy program coming up in april 2020 and um, we want to not only uh, have make the biomicro um, applied uh, program available in Europe or in the Western uh, countries by um, by charging a certain amount that is uh, that is reasonable in, in these areas but you also want to make the uh, program available to countries especially of the global south and um, for this we couple the pay for the program to the GDP of the country so this is coming up in April and we'll update you on our channels, on our social media channels and on Barmink Academy and the newsletter. Now, um, secondly, I'd like to address that um, attached to the biomimicry practitioner education and the academy is our co-creation platform, Cobium, where we use a global network and a, a digital co-creation platform to solve challenges from social innovation, so non-profit challenges, but also especially from, from businesses who want to become sustainable and innovate responsibly. Um, graduates from the Biomic Academy automatically enter into this pool of experts who can co-create on the platform. And if you want to know more, follow Cobayam on the social media channels. Um, now, I'd like to mention in this respect that we follow the principles of the Radical Collaboration Manifesto of the Responsible Innovation Network. And if you want to know more about this, so the, the foundations and the statutes of, um, of cooperation instead of competition in business and in all innovation that we do, then uh, check out this website that is linked up here. On, on you or you can use the QR code. So finally, there's nothing more to say, but um, please visit www.biomimicryacademy.com and if you are interested in attending one of our courses, um, make, make use of your, atten your attendance to this webinar by using the, uh, the voucher um, hashtag webinar 2024 uh, secure your 20% discount. So with this, I'd like to thank you again for your participation. I'm looking forward to seeing you again during our training program.